NBC's Kelly O'Donnell is at her post at the White House. Sam Stein is managing editor at The Bulwark and an MSNBC contributor. Also with us, US, former U.S. Congresswoman from Maryland, Donna Edwards, who is an MSNBC political analyst, and Adam Gentleson, a Democratic strategist who worked for Senators John Fetterman and Harry Reid. Kelly, let's start with you at the White House. There's going to be tons of scrutiny on this Wisconsin event, just as there have been on President Biden's radio interviews and his appearance yesterday. So what's the strategy today and charting this path forward as they try to turn the page? Well, Allie, the president left the White House here just uh, several minutes ago, heading for the airport. And you're right, every movement, every word, how he comes across will all be scrutinized and seen through the lens of life post-debate and the current stakes that he faces. As he says, he will continue in the race, will move forward and can't be pushed out, while there are those in the party who have expressed concerns about his fitness to remain candidate, also donors and others in the wider Democratic community who are concerned about his chances of winning. So part of what we're hearing from officials, both campaign side, White House side, is a sense of the awareness of those stakes, that he must do well, he must be visible, there must be a more regular and obvious interaction actions with the press and with the public, more of those unscripted moments. He is known to give speeches, as all presidents do, using a teleprompter, but to break away from that more so that people can get a sense of how he is doing, how he is functioning, and uh, just a real kind of measure of the man as a candidate now under all this scrutiny. So that happens today, a rally in Madison, Wisconsin, a sit-down interview, and then we expect to see additional things added. You pointed out the push from the campaign. They have an aggressive approach for what they will do in the month of July. And really, there's limited time for the president to try to change impressions, yeah. to try to shore up support, and to create some new impressions, if he's able to do that, uh, that could solidify his base. There are many members of his party who say they are standing with him, others <clears throat> who tell us both privately and hinting at it that they want to see how this goes before they make an assessment. Sam, it sounds like the short way of summarizing the campaign strategy is they want Biden to do more more appearances, a more aggressive travel schedule. But you have people like The Wall Street Journal's Peggy Noonan saying that might not be realistic. She writes in part, he can't do what they want him to do. He can't execute it. He tried to do it last week. The debate was, in effect, a live high stakes interview. He won't be able to do it next week or next month either. Old age involves plateaus and plummets. It gets worse, not better. I think what Noonan is arguing there and raises the obvious question, what if he does do more as he's being told to do and it fails. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the conundrum that this campaign faces. I mean, when Biden went into the debate, it was with the idea that he would show his vitality, uh, show that he was up to the task. He himself verbatim said, watch me, when he was questioned about his vitality and, and, and mental acuity. And we did. And I think the problem here is that the campaign has not just a few tools to turn this around. Obviously, uh, Biden himself has hinted that he needs to go to you know, shorter days, uh, nothing past 8 p.m., things like that, uh, but that they wasted uh, six or seven days in the post-debate uh, aftermath kind of coming up with a plan that everyone knew was the plan that they needed, right? Uh, if he was going to get through it, it would, he would have to change the narrative. He'd have to do more unscripted moments. He'd have to do more aggressive campaigning. He'd have to sit down with some media. Uh, mm -hmm. He'd have to show that that was just a one-off. What happened in the six or seven days since then is that they kind of hunkered down. Uh, very few public appearances, no interviews, nothing off of teleprompter. And so in a campaign where you have four, four and a half months left, to waste a week uh, and let these questions pile up is almost malpractice. I think that's certainly a complaint that I've heard from Democratic lawmakers who wished that the outreach was much swifter than it was. But Congresswoman, counter to this strategy of Biden doing more, was Biden quipping yesterday to a group of Democratic governors that in order to get more sleep, he might limit his events after 8 p.m. Now, Governor Gavin Newsom of California said that's more of a figurative 8 p.m. than a literal one. But that said, the New York Post ran a cover based on the 8 o'clock bedtime saying, quote, that's fine, nothing ever happens then anyway. I know it's meant to reassure people, but how do you think the public hears even a joke like that? Well, look, I think the reality is that people know that the president was just speaking to the idea that he needs to better manage his time and his schedule. And look, the fact is, it's not just the more that the president do does in the coming uh, several days and weeks. It's what he does. It's being out there and present in the public 
uh, both scripted and unscripted moments, doing interviews and demonstrating by his actions that he's ready for the task of both running for president and being president for the next four years. I happen to believe that this is recoverable. I don't think it's easy, and I don't want to sugarcoat what happened at that Thursday debate, but I do think it's re recoverable. And I'm hearing from an awful lot of Democrats that they want to give the president the time and the space to make sure that he can run the race that he needs to run to beat Donald Trump. Yeah, Donna, I was going to ask you that because you and I talked, what, two days ago, and I asked you what you were hearing from your former colleagues, and many of them seemed like they were in wait-and-see mode as opposed to some of their colleagues who were either publicly coming forward and saying it's time to go or saying, you know, privately, do I sign a letter, do I not sign a letter asking him to go? Has that kind of remained the stakes for you in your conversations, Donna? Well, I think that's true. I mean, it, it, look, members of Congress get back into town um, next week. I think we're going to hear yes. from many more of them. I think there are a lot of my former colleagues who really are in the wait and see mode and, or they're like solidly behind uh, President Biden and they don't think that he should be pushed out. I also think that some of them are hearing from their constituents, especially the base of our, our party, that is a bit offended by the donor class, the elite class, the Washington Post and the New York Times editorial boards trying to push uh, President Biden out. Adam, you and I have worked on some of these campaigns together. Uh, I, of course, on the reporting side, you on the operative side. But you've worked in similar circumstances to the Biden team right now, having been with Senator Fetterman after his stroke. The Biden camp's not only in the position right now of reassuring its own party, but now big dollar donors are saying they're going to withhold money until Biden is replaced. Taken together, is that all too much incoming from all sides? It's certainly a lot. I think whether it's too much is really going to depend on what happens in the next couple of weeks. I think what you're seeing from the Biden campaign is what I would characterize as necessary but not sufficient. You know, what they're doing right now, um, having this interview, having these events over the weekend, all these things are important to do. Um, but if you're going to really reassure people, you have to do more. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, you know, the question is how much do these efforts of reassurance take off some of that pressure and how much do those efforts fail to take off the pressure and then have that pressure continue to build? But when you are hearing from all of these factions of the party, when you're hearing from members of yeah. Congress, when you're hearing from donors, uh, it does become a lot to handle and potentially unsustainable. I will say in the last week, I have felt like there are shades of this present moment that remind me of conversations I was having with rival campaigns in 2020, people whispering that the then former vice president had lost a step after seeing him on the debate stage. Adam, do you see those shades here, too? You can you can certainly see the shades. And again, I think it all comes back to whether whether he recovers. Um, I think that, um, you know, Age is an issue that people struggle with. Uh, decline is is real. Um, he doesn't seem to be incapable of performing the duties of the job. Um, and you know, like you said, this is something that's that's been an issue for him ever since the beginning of his campaign in 2020, and he's managed to weather it every single time. Whether that's possible now, I think remains to be seen, and entirely hinges on what he and his campaign are able to do over the next days and potentially weeks. I think that's right. Sam, he's staying in. But you have new reporting about preparing for what if Biden doesn't. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, I spent the last couple of days talking to a dozen Democratic operatives in high ranks, people who are in touch with donors and lawmakers. And the, the general consensus is almost to a person, they do not believe he can survive this. Now, they've been wrong before, right? Biden loves to prove yeah. these people wrong. In fact, <laughs> the, the thing that motivates them from the 2020 race was the was the New York Times editorial board endorsing yes. Klobuchar and Warren, where he got the endorsement of the elevator operator. Remember, she was brought to the convention. They love this stuff. But uh, elsewhere in the party, there is sort of a resignation that this is all going to play out. Eventually, he will realize not only that he can't be the candidate, but that if he remained candidate, he couldn't be Donald Trump. And where they're coalescing is around Kamala Harris. And the reason it has to be Kamala Harris is twofold. One is all the infrastructure is sort of built around the Biden-Harris ticket, right? I mean, it's not just that she would inherit the money, but the messaging. Think about all the messaging that's already been crafted by Democratic groups. It's around promoting the Biden-Harris agenda. If you put in a governor from outside of the administration, you have to actually redo that messaging. Uh, and then the second thing is, obviously, is that it would be deeply offensive to key constituencies if she were pushed out uh, in favor of someone else who isn't tested 
on the national stage or who has never been at the federal level like she has. And so basically, uh, this person who had been relatively divisive in Democratic circles, that being the vice president, is now being looked upon as sort of a savior of sorts for the party. It's all happened in the span of about two weeks. I'm really having another deja vu moment because during the Veep stakes in 2020, the conventional wisdom was it has to be Kamala Harris. All roads seem to lead there. <laughs> now here we are. I mean, if we want to continue that narrative. But Donna, I think, has the administration done enough where in a post Joe Biden era, if that were to be where this goes, have they done enough to elevate the vice president so that the public and the party have confidence in her? It's been a bumpy road. Well, that's true, but I think if, if you look um, over the time, especially post the Dobbs uh, decision, that uh, Kamala Harris has really become, you know, the spokesperson for the administration, for the campaign on issues that are of deep concern around reproductive freedom, around democracy, um, for uh, for this this team. And so I think she is eminently capable. Um, and the question is how this happens or whether it should happen at all. And I do think that we are still uh, premature in that uh, in that phase, but there's no reason at all. Kamala Harris is the vice president. Obviously, the voters had already decided that she was the one uh, to be next in line for the presidency. Um, and so that would seem to make, uh, make sense. And I think that Sam is right, that at uh, the base of the party, black women, black voters, women, um, that you can't afford to tick that those groups off. Uh, and Kamala Harris sim simply checks those boxes. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.